everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming to see my talk. Um, I hope you're having a great first day. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on occupied Kumeyaay lands and offer respect towards the people past and present. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for another amazing year of JSConf US. It's already starting to be, it's already off to a really great start and I'm so grateful to be here. I've been wanting to give this talk for a very long time. Um, I used to live on the same block as the public library in my neighborhood and I would go constantly to pick up books that I'd place on hold online, to co-work in the summers because I didn't have AC, um, and to print out concert tickets because I didn't want to spend my money on a printer and printer ink. And going there so often, I got to have that experience of using the internet from the library and it made me curious what it's like to depend on libraries around the country for internet access. And since then, I've made an effort to stop into public libraries in every city I visit to compare those experiences. And that's kind of what was the impetus for this talk. So if you walk past the computer bay in any public library, it becomes rapidly evident that using the internet when you don't own a capable device, personal computer, or have a broad, personal broadband connection goes far beyond the, per, the physical limitations. 30% of the rural US is closer to dial-up speeds than broadband speeds, and urban broadband users are on 3.1 megabytes per second, while rural users are lucky to achieve a mere 500 kilobytes per second in comparison. A 2018 study by Microsoft concluded that 162.8 million people do not use the internet at broadband speeds. While the FCC has previously reported that broadband is not available to 24.7 million Americans, the discrepancy is, par is particularly stark in rural areas. For example, Microsoft found that in Ferry County, Washington, um, they estimated that only 2% of people use broadband service versus the 100% that the federal government is said to have access in that area. <coughs> While many might focus on just the rural access, city broadband access is also just as relevant. The University of Illinois of Chicago's Digital Excellence in Chicago report found that 40% of Chicago residents, especially Latinx population, have limited or no access to the internet. Of that 40%, 35% have to use Wi-Fi in public places to get access. 25% of all Chicagoans do not use the internet, of those people do not use the internet at all, while 15% only have limited access. And here on the map, we can see those discrepancies based on geography and how the specifically happens in low income areas. On the left, you can see the percentage who have internet access at home, and on the right, you can see the percentage who have who do not have internet access at home because of difficulty of availability. This has a real effect on people's livelihoods. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics employment data shows that the highest unemployment rates are frequently located in the counties with the lowest availability of broadband. This is why the 16,700 public library locations nationwide are so vital to the internet and on their own are an incredible so source of information about our users. The Institute of Museums and Library Services 2019 report on the 2016 fiscal year found that for every 5,000 people, libraries, uh, for every 5,000 people, libraries serving a small population size offer 23.68 computers versus uh, while only 4.04 .04 library computers are available in libraries that serve large populations. Um, for example, 70% of Idaho's 103 libraries are the only source of free internet in Idaho's rural and remote communities. After significant investment from the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, the mean broadband connection speed in Idaho libraries is still only 12.8 megabytes per second a steep drop compared to the national average of 57.4. The report continued to detail the discrepancies in availability. Um, the number of public access internet computers per 5,000 people does obviously vary across states. Seven states, including Hawaii, had fewer than four computers per 5,000 people, while two states, including Vermont and uh, Nebraska, had more than nine. Most states had between 10 and 20 public access internet computers per stationary outlet, DC having the most at 38.46. Libraries are highly popular amongst adolescents and teenagers who want to spend time with other people their age because they're open, accessible, free, and librarians make them feel welcome. 
In many branches, they even assign areas for teenagers to be with one another. Comparing to the social space of the library with the social spaces of commercial establishments like Starbucks or McDonald's, not everyone can afford to frequent them, and not all paying customers are welcome to stay for long. Black and brown people, older people, and poor and homeless people often don't even consider entering these spaces. They know from experience that simply standing outside a high-end eatery can prompt managers to call the police. And in my personal experience, I've been in a coffee shop using Wi-Fi and watched managers ask a, re a person who recently had come from jail and was a homeless person, I watched them ask this person to leave and tell them that they were not welcome at that establishment because they did not fit in. And this really is limiting so much access for people that desperately need it. Um, so where do they go? They go to the Biblioteca, of course, and not just during opening hours. The Pew Research Center's 2016 Library Usage and Engagement Report found that 7% of Americans aged 16 and over use the library Wi-Fi signal outside when libraries are closed. A lot of the main reasons for internet usage in public libraries are similar to a lot of our own basic internet needs. Checking email, doing research, in many cases on personal health, and outside of these standard uses, the most different are the need for access to take classes and get certifications. For example, getting a food handling license to work in a restaurant is a process that takes about three hours online and is one of the most common uh, certifications out there for people in low income positions. Historically, this disproportionately affects black, Latinx, homeless, and low income people and immigrants the most with 55% of new American arrivals visiting the library to use the internet on a rate of once a week. Kids under the age of 16 are also highly effective. Seven in 10 teachers now assign homework that requires web access, yet one third of kindergartners through 12th graders in the United States from low income and rural households are unable to go online from home. Some students in Coachella, California and Huntsville, Alabama depend on school buses that have free Wi-Fi to complete their homework. The buses are sometimes parked in residential neighborhoods overnight so that children can connect and continue studying. In cities like Detroit, Miami, and New Orleans, where as many as one-third of homes do not have broadband, children crowd libraries and fast food restaurants to use free hotspots. Broadband access limitations don't just change when and where you use the internet, but how. Google's 2011 State of Interactivity report shows us the difference between usage for people based on their broadband speeds. Here we can see that people with limited access tend to download and rely on offline more than those who rely on the cloud because they have higher access to broadband speeds. Specific to the library experience, there are a few standout considerations. Timeouts are frequently out of the control of librarians on PC reservation software. And it is a huge barrier for systemically oppressed people because when your identity contingencies generate social pressure, the result of this being stereotype threat, that means that people are less likely to speak up and ask for help when they need a longer session on the computer. And in most cases, there are many library locations where the librarians are not fully aware of how to make these changes or even have the administrative access to do so. Um, when I visited the San Francisco Public Library, I was shocked to find that with a 25-minute guest pass, I, had, I only had access for a total of 15 minutes, with five minutes at the beginning going into starting up the reservation system, and the last five minutes bombarded with alerts that my session would end soon. Imagine trying to take a three-hour certification course that cannot be saved and returned to later under those conditions. A prime example is how the Chicago Public Library requires people to demonstrate through ID that they are not residents of Chicago to access computers via guest pass. Some libraries charge a dollar for guest passes for computer usage due to low budgets and limited number of devices and bias. As we can see from the librarian's example of a biased coworker below, people like this are highly likely to accelerate charges on overdue materials and limit people and bar people from internet access in the library. On the technical side, Windows 10 is the most prevalent operating system. While just uh, in 2018, just last year, many librarians reported that they're still in the process of moving from Windows 8 to Windows 10. Um, and try to, so there's also a lot of device and Wi-Fi hotspot lending that libraries do, but most of the time this is at a fee. They usually charge about $5 
to check out a Wi-Fi hotspot and take it home. And in some cases, if they're lucky, they have access to remote device management software that allows them to turn these devices off if they're overdue. But the charges can be up to $150 for not returning a Wi-Fi hotspot to the library. Um, with these high charges, with device remote uh, management software that librarians frequently use to throttle data so that they don't have to pay high charges. Um, we see that a lot of libraries have difficulty offering these services without grants and subsidies um, that are highly needed in their communities. Being barred usage of the internet in libraries is much more common than you'd think. In Seattle, patrons who owe $15 are blocked from borrowing and patrons who owe $25 have their accounts sent to collection agencies. Even in prosperous Seattle, 20% of accounts are blocked due to debt. This should be changing soon, as Seattle just had a, a vote in August 6th of this year where they passed Prop 1, which uh, is going to eliminate the fine system at the Seattle Public Library, which is fantastic news. But, and we see that this is also happening in DC, Salt Lake City, and Baltimore. The San Francisco Public Library has 5% of accounts blocked due to overdue fines, but in low income areas, the rate is as high as 11%. And they're currently also going through a proposal to go fine free as well. Um, and this is important to know because fines aren't even a significant revenue for any libraries. Salt Lake City went fine free in 2017 after finding that late fees accounted for just 0.3% of the city library's total revenue. Research shows overdue fines do not ensure borrowed materials end up back on the shelves. And libraries that have gone fine free have not experienced increase in late returns. In fact, one library saw that its late return rate dropped from 9% to 4% following fine elimination. Some of the most pressing needs when it comes to internet access in libraries are PC reservation compli compatible access, Accessibility shortcuts, most notably, access to changing signs of text on the screens. Some, because some PC reservation softwares obfuscate access to any kind of visual controls. Also text to speech access and just most of the accessibility shortcuts that are available on our own personal computers being obfuscated by PC reservation software. Of the libraries that do have assistive tech um, on site, they're often limited to select locations, making access even harder. And um, with low broadband speeds, performance is also a super paramount issue, as well as authentication and anti surveillance measures that we'll get a little bit deeper into. The Google Need for Speed report found that 53% of website visitors will leave if a web page doesn't load within three seconds. And with the average load time for sites is 19 seconds on a 3G connection. That's about as long as it takes to sing the entire alphabet song. And 14 seconds on a 4G connection. When surveyed, they found that one out of two people expect a page to load in less than two seconds. And comparing faster sites to slower sites, the faster sites had an average sessions length that were 70% 7 longer and bounce rates that were 35% lower. 61% of users are unlikely to return to a mobile site that they had trouble accessing, and 40% of them will visit a competitor's website as well. Instead, mobile sites that loaded in five seconds earned almost double the revenue of websites that took 19 seconds to load. And decreased load speeds by just one second can boost conversion by nearly 27%. Um, part of the problem lies with ads on mobile. Mobile ads take advantage of it take average of five seconds to load, about double the time it takes for desktop ads to load, according to the Media Ratings Council. Email and online, and then another issue past performance is authentication. Um, recently there was this Twitter thread a few months ago, which made me sad that it happened after my talk and not before, because I was excited to tell you about this, but on, email and online messaging um, SMS services like WhatsApp are truly the modern catch-22. You need an email to get a phone number, and you need a phone number to get an email. Um, so especially for people struggling with homelessness, this is a huge barrier for them to, to escape this oppression. Um, and I personally think that this problem is ripe for password managers to find a solution to. I'd really love to see authentication stations in libraries utilizing authenticator app technology and having access based on a librarian's approval. 
Um, for users that are not as web literate, we also need to consider their experiences with security um, in dealing with sensitive materials like paying bills, banking, and sharing photos to detect an example of ways that we can handle this is by making sure that we detect if a device is a new device and it's their first time logging onto it. We can offer them alerts and messaging like GDRP, communicating with users and finding a way to tell them which precautions to take before dealing with sensitive data on computers that may be unsecure. Another security factor is surveillance. Facial recognition software is creeping into libraries, starting in academic libraries today. The most prevalent threat, however, to intellectual freedom since 9-11 is Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Colloquially called the library records provision, the government can demand library records via a secret court order and without probable cause that the information is related to a suspected terrorist plot. They can block librarians from revealing the request to anyone. And the term records does not just cover the books you check out, but includes internet check-ins, search histories, and hard drives from library computers. In 2001, libraries all over the country took action to protect their patrons. They started posting these warning post posters within view of computer stations. In fall of 2002, the Library Research Center at the University of Illinois surveyed 1,500 libraries and found that of the 40, 444 libraries that had been subject to law enforcement requests for information about patrons, 225 had not cooperated, but 219 had. Librarians in Santa Cruz demonstrated their opposition by taking drastic measures and shredding all historical information, including computer usage, on a daily basis. In 2005, Four Connecticut librarians going under the monicum of, Jan of John Doe with the help of the ACLU sued the U.S. Attorney General to lift the gag order the librarians had been subject to when ordered to produce patrons' records. By 2006, the D FBI dropped their defense of the gag provision. Section 215 had expired in May 2015, however, with the passage of the U.S. Freedom Act later that year, the expired parts of that law, with the exception of the gag order, uh, were, reportedly, were reported broadly as restored and renewed and come up for expiration this year in December. But there's a lot of success stories, too. Libraries are still the most helpful resource for learning about the internet and web literacy classes are the most highly requested programming at libraries. Because library staff need to be totally up to date on their digital skills, they often learn these things just in time and turn around and immediately start teaching them to patrons. My favorite resource by librarians are the zines published by ReadMe, an advocacy group of UCLA library studies majors who print zines and host crypto parties. Um, and there are also libraries that are offering some of the most high-tech access out there. The Los Angeles Public Library has the Octavia Butler Makerspace, a monumentally popular attraction at the Central Library location. It's a great activity space for families who can toy around with 3D printing and all kinds of other high-tech gadgets. And the Austin Public Library impressed me the most with their laptop stations, which provide physical privacy for computer users with some of the most up-to-date technology. So all you have to do is like scan your library card and unlock one of these laptops, much like you would unlock a bicycle out in a rideshare program and you can use the laptop anywhere you want in the library. Um, the biggest tax credits, grants, and subsidies only go so far to help support public library internet access. All the most robust programs are the result of public and private partnerships. So we as a community should be doing everything that we can to encourage the companies that we work for to get involved and help build partnerships to get better hardware, software, and help. Um, Over-reliance on the federal broadband stimulus program has tied censorship to funding and thus the future has the potential to be bleak as we've already seen how the Patriot Act has affected library usage of the internet. In 2018, Microsoft kicked off the AirBand initiative, a mix of old and new technologies that involves harnessing the unused channels between television broadcasts known as white space. It's basically unassigned and unused spectrum below 700 megahertz um, historically used to transmit UHF and VHF 
television signals. This technology is sometimes called super Wi-Fi because it behaves like regular Wi-Fi but uses low-powered television channels to cover greater distances than Wi-Fi hotspots. It's, less ex it's a less expensive alternative to wiring homes, particularly in less populated and remote regions. And imagine the capacity that this could have for urban areas where people don't have personal access at home, um, where their kids need to stick, stay on buses to be able to use Wi-Fi to finish their homework. Um, if your company can't get involved directly, you can get involved directly yourself. Volunteer to lead a crypto party at your local library. Teach workshops to the people in your community and organize your next meetup at a library computer lab so that you have, give more access to people outside of your own personal circle. Um, so thank you so much for coming and hearing about what it's like to use the internet at the library. I hope next time you stop by a library and check out what it's like to use their computers and not just your fancy MacBooks. Thank you.